Yes, I can start. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, g'day everybody. Uh, that's uh, Ola for Aussies. So, uh, hello and thank you for joining this session on Drupal, the choice for government in Australia. Um, so, my name is Alfred Deeb and I'll be presenting to you today. Now, unfortunately, because of a mix up and changing time slots, my colleague Steve Worley um, is not here to present this new time. However, I will speak for his parts as best I can. And my apologies for the inconvenience caused for those that were hoping to attend this originally scheduled session yesterday. So just a quick background on myself. So I graduated in 1998 in computer systems engineering and computer science. I have a background in technical architecture across applications, integrations and infrastructure. I am the founding director of a, an Australian based digital services uh, innovation company. And I've been working almost exclusively for government since uh, 2014. And among many hats I wear, uh, I am a whole of government digital platform advocate. And so, as I mentioned, so Steve's not here, but I would like to introduce him nonetheless, as he's been a big part of this presentation today. Um, so Steve's been working in the web industry for a better part of 10 years and recently been focusing on uh, DevOps for several government tech uh, stacks. So we both work for Salsa Digital, and uh, Salsa Digital is a digital services company specializing in GovTech, civic tech, and open data. And so we've been heavily focused on helping governments become more open, more connected, and more consolidated. And we've got a seven year legacy in Drupal. Okay, so it's a long session with uh, lots to cover. And uh, we've broken the session into eight key parts. So I'll uh, open up by talking about the, the role, the pain, uh, the authorities and the policies uh, for digital government in Australia. Uh, then talk a little bit about the characteristics and qualities of uh, whole of government digital platform and uh, programs. Uh, then we'll talk about the journey and the criteria and adoption of Drupal within government. And then we'll provide some highlights for each of the major government jurisdictions adopting Drupal in Australia, namely the Commonwealth and the three states of Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. And then finally, we'll wrap up and hopefully allow for some uh, time to cover some questions. Okay, so before we get started, there is a couple of important disclaimers. Um, so I am not a public servant, um, nor am I a Drupal developer, and I am also not representing government agencies. Um, I am, however, drawing upon my relationships and experiences in delivering whole of government digital platforms and programs. Um, and finally, there's a lot of content uh, within this presentation. So rightly or wrongly, it's uh, been produced in a takeaway format. So uh, try your hardest, please, to not read all the words and follow me as best you can. Okay, so here goes. So part one, um, digital government in Australia, the role, the pain, the authorities and the policies. So let's start with the why, right? So what is the role of government? So, well, we have many, so governments have many responsibilities, but one of the most relevant to us is that they are there to deliver information and services to citizens. So information and services that are easy to find and easy to understand, but they're also responsible for delivering great user experiences, experiences that are efficient, that are elegant, that are intuitive and that are consistent. So why is this all important? Well, among many reasons, quality information services help citizens, they help communities, and they help industries thrive. Um, there are, however, three barriers that make this difficult for governments to deliver quality information and great user experiences. Um, so barrier one is fragmentation. So many governments, uh, technologies, services, information, they're fragmented. So consequently, user experiences are fragmented, creating confusion, frustration, and inefficiencies for the citizen. Uh, barrier two is silos. So there are historic structures of government that have created silos resulting in difficulties in solving the same problems. So this leads to waste and prohibits the co-creation of solutions that can truly be world-class. The third barrier is proprietary technologies. We all know it. Um, all of us that are here at DrupalCon uh, appreciate that. And so the historic prevalence of proprietary technologies in government has led to vendor lock-in and high total costs of ownership, which are consequently prohibits innovation and risks stagnation. Painful, right? So what can we do about it? Well, well, of course we can start with a dream. So let's imagine a world where governments are truly more open, more connected and more consolidated. So more open, by being more open, right, by educating, building and supporting open data, open APIs and open source technologies, and which then in turn 
results in greater transparency and greater opportunities to co-innovate with citizens, with other government jurisdictions and with industry. More, being more connected uh, with citizens is by using technology to better digitally engage with the citizen. Also being more connected with each other, for example, cross jurisdictions to result in greater collaboration, solving common problems. So more consolidated, the, the third dream and you know is being more consolidated by designing, building, maintaining and scaling whole of government common platforms, which unify services, removes duplication and addresses fragmentation across technology, information and user experiences. So you're dreaming, I hear you say, uh, yes, uh, I am, and uh, but to dream is not enough. So thankfully, there are peak bodies in government with influence that are doing something about it. And so here are three of them. So influencer number one, um, there's the Federal Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet on behalf of the Global Open Partnership Initiative, which has committed Australian government through a national action plan to be more open through innovation, open data and common platforms. And so in a, uh, influencer number two, right, is the Digital Transformation Agency, the DTA. So they are a leading digital authority for Australian government and they are responsible for many standards and guidelines to help open, connect and unify government services. And finally, influencer number three um, is the Australian Digital Council. So this council brings together leading digital authorities across the federal level and across the state governments to share, align and progress public data and digital transformation in Australia. Okay, and so for completeness, it's also worth highlighting global peak bodies that are bringing governments together to address common pain points uh, globally. Um, a particular group that I've called out here is uh, called the Digital Nations, which are a group of nine leading digital governments throughout the world. And similar to the Australian Digital Council, they come together to share knowledge, work on joint projects and leverage each other's success. So you can see those nine leading agencies that I've uh, highlighted here in red. Um, sadly, no Spain and no Australia. Come on Aussies, uh, not sure how you say come on in Spanish. Um, all right, so, so how can governments achieve good digital, right? Well, by starting first with well-considered policy standards, frameworks and guidelines. And there are many. Um, however, four that we feel are relevant to this vision of being more open, more connected, more consolidated are as presented here. So number one is the open source policy. So this is a policy from 2011, which states, quote, uh, Australian government agencies will actively participate in open source software communities and contribute back where appropriate. So um, number two is the digital service standards. So these are a set of 13 standards that represent best practice principles for government to design and deliver citizen services uh, that are simple, clear and fast. Now, one of the 13, for example, is digital service standard number eight, which states, quote, make all source code open by default. Um, so influencer number three is the uh, digital services platform strategy. So among many things, it states that we need to, quote, use technology and data to connect and unify government services and to develop integration standards, including API standards to support platform interoperability. And finally, number four, uh, which is the whole of government architecture workforce. So this is an initiative also led by the DTA, the Digital Transformation Agency, to develop whole of government uh, technology architecture models. And so these models are there to ensure investments are in scalable common platforms across whole of government and to avoid uh, agencies spending time and money and effort in duplicated solutions that are trying to repeat and solve the same thing. Okay, so these are the policies and standards that I just spoke to, they're at the national level. However, we also have equivalent policies and standards for each of the individual states and territories um, or you know, jurisdictions uh, within government. And I won't list them out individually. However, uh, as you can see, we have a representation for each jurisdiction. Okay, so now on to part two, whole of government digital platforms. So what are they and what benefits do they provide? Okay, so according to the Oxford and Collins Dictionary, uh, well, not really. So according to the Digital Transformation Agency, whole of government digital platforms provide capabilities that are shared across policy areas and deliver great value through common technical foundations. Whoa, my goodness, what a mouthful. 
Um, so let's try a different approach with an illustration. So what can a whole of government content management system platform look like? So imagine you have multiple sites, each on their own hosting infrastructure, uh, including security protection caching, if any, their own CMS, their own content models and their own um, user experiences. So not to mention their own separate patching and maintenance contracts. So you multiply that by 50, multiply that by 100, multiply that by 500 times. What a fragmented mess that would be. Um, it's dark, it's cold, and it's gloomy. So now imagine um, where you have a common uh, platform, including hosting, security, and caching. Uh, you have a common managed content management system, and you have a common content model and a common managed user experience and all 100, 200, and 500 present web presences uh, that are served upon it. Uh, oh, what a consolidated bliss, right? The skies are blue, the sun is shining, and the roses are smelling great. And okay, so what are the common qualities uh, of a whole of government and digital platform uh, or program? What must they have, right? Well, I've broken it up into two parts. You've got program qualities and you've got uh, platform qualities. So let's start with the uh, program qualities. Um, there are many, however, eight of them that are here, and I, I'll call out a few of them. The first one that I'm calling out is community sharing and contribution, which is you know, there to leverage from others and give back to others, right? The second one is simplified procurement, perhaps not an obvious one, and that's government to government procurement. And it should be easy, simple, fast, without the pain of preparing, submitting, evaluating, procuring, and managing contracts, SLAs, et cetera. Um, not to mention those poor vendors that spend hundreds of hours writing government tender responses. And uh, I'm not traumatized at all. So the third one to call out is um, managed and consolidated user experiences. You know, and that's a user validated led experience that is consolidated and consistent. And the third quality across the program is that it's got to be easy uh, to, um, to adopt, um, sorry, easy to adopt the ability to self-serve. So, you know, through great training artifacts, by, for example. So again, there are many, but hopefully this gives you a, a good idea. Okay, so now for platform qualities. So again, there are many, and I've shown uh, eight of them here. And it's hopefully not a surprise and what you should expect from a whole of government platform responsible for delivering critical information and services. Again, to name a few, secure, paramount, right? So we need to trust. Right. The second one I've listed here is resilience, right? Equally paramount. It needs to stand when we need it most. Um, a third one I'm calling out is um, scale. So it needs to be able to grow as demands uh, increases. And just to call out a, a fourth one as an example is accessible. So it needs to enable public servants to create quality content and user experiences that are inclusive from the start and at its core, not as an afterthought. Again, there are many. Okay, so what does this all mean? Uh, this means that um, individual government agencies and individual public servants don't need to worry about a bunch of stuff. And you can see the sort of stuff that they need not to have to worry about as we've got here, right? What it also means is that public servants get to focus on just delivering best user experiences for citizens. And they do this by focusing on quality services and quality information that is easy to find and easy to understand as we've talked about, right? And they can achieve this by focusing on service design, content design, user research, accessible content. Again, not for them to worry about all that other stuff around contracts, procurement, um, security, resilience, that should be all taken care of for them. Okay, so now on to part three, why Drupal? the moment we've all been waiting for. Um, all right, so we've identified the pain. Uh, we've now uh, got good policies and standards in place. We've defined the characteristics and qualities of what a good whole of government platform uh, and program should look like. Now it's time to choose a CMS. Um, if you take note, we just had a little bit of fun. Um, can anyone see the little uh, icon here and anyone spot any of the other icons on the others and if they look familiar, just for fun. Okay, so there's a, a little overlap here. However, I present these specific key criteria and again, a subset of many that have been used by many government jurisdictions to evaluate the CMS solution of choice. And again, to name a few, the first one, open source, we know, right? Um, it's why we're all here. Uh, this, the second one is that it needs to be highly adopted. 
right? The third one is that the CMS needs to have an active community. And the fourth to call out is, um, of course, it needs to be uh, feature rich, easily adaptable and easy to use. And so several jurisdictions went out to evaluate many of these CMSs based on this considered evaluation process per this uh, sample criteria above. This is just a subset of the criteria that a lot of these jurisdictions um, have used to win an, uh, when selecting a CMS. And so the winner is, you'll never guess. <laughs> yep, it was uh, Drupal. Um, dramatic pause. Um, and so, all right. Four of the nine jurisdictions within the Australian government have selected Drupal for their whole of government platform solution. So in 2014, we had the Commonwealth government. Um, in 2016, we had Western Australia. And in 2017, we had the state of Victoria. And just recently in 2019, we had New South Wales government. So each having similar characteristics and realizing similar benefits and outcomes, but equally each a little bit different. Um, but also each being at different stages of their digital transformation and consolidation journey. And so the next parts of this presentation is really to cover uh, some highlights of each of them. Okay, so let's go to the first one, all right? Part four, which is Drupal is the choice for the Australian Commonwealth government um, known as GovCMS. So GovCMS is the name of the Drupal based whole of government CMS platform at that Commonwealth level. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Even more of a mouthful is the definition here, which is GovCMS is a whole of government platform for Commonwealth departments and agencies to host sites and serve information to Australian citizens. Um, so the highlights for GovCMS is as listed here, right? So it's a fully managed secure hosting and fully managed Drupal. It's almost six years old. There are 306 sites on the platform on behalf of 92 government agencies. The third one we've got listed there is that it supports uh, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, and now with Drupal 9 in alpha. Um, the platform is um, IRAP security accredited. So IRAP is an accreditation provided by the Cybersecurity Authority of the Australian government. Um, it's an open source stack, pretty big deal. And it has the largest Drupal footprint uh, in government uh, in Australia. So GovCMS offers two consumption models, right? So model one is known as SaaS, software as a service, right? So it's a fully managed security accredited hosting platform. It's a fully managed Drupal application um, and it provides the flexibility to um, maintain your own theme. Um, the second model is uh, PaaS, platform as a service. So this is a managed hosting platform supported by a custom Drupal application. And so with PaaS, you have the choice to uh, of managed security and managed uh, CDM. And with PaaS, the website owner is responsible for managing their own Drupal and their own theme and their own patching and maintenance. Currently for GovCMS, of those 309 sites, there are 200 sites on the SaaS consumption model and there are 109 sites on the PaaS consumption model. Okay, so stats and facts, there are lots. So it's the biggest program it's the oldest program and it's the program with the most number of sites. So the numbers are going to be big and impressive. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. However, we have presented lots of key statistics across key themes, uh, which you can see uh, a couple of them here. So program age and size, team size and structure, usage stats and performance, uptime and service desk, modules and open source, and market size adoption. Let's call out a couple, however. So on this slide, we've just called out one, and that is that in, you know, in the last financial year, there were 122 sites that were added uh, to the platform. So on this slide, two stats and facts are highlighted, um, uh, probably which are the most impressive is uh, number one, an impressive 2 billion amount of hits in March, 2020. And that was due to COVID, uh, as well as um, one of the uh, big sites, health.gov.au, right, major contribution to this load. Um, and that was only actually for SaaS traffic. The other um, big and impressive statistic <clears throat> is this one here in that 80% of the traffic for the, for the last previous five years was received in only four months in 2020, again, due to COVID. Okay, I promise no more stats and facts after this one. Uh, lots are highlighted here, but again, one, um, 
to point out that is uh, worth pointing out is that um, two uh, training manuals have been open source, specifically the content administration training manual for content managers, uh, which helps public servants uh, manage content. Um, and the second one is the uh, site builder training manual, which has been open source for Drupal developers. So these manuals are a great initiative to enable the community to self-serve, um, to upskill, right, and to optionally contribute back improvements. Okay, so lots of great noteworthy sites, and we're not going to call all of them other than to state that many of these sites provide very important, often critical information to serve Australian citizens. As an example, we've got cyber.gov.au, um, which is the Australian Cyber Security Centre, and that is a symbolic statement of having them on the platform, um, and it's symbolic of the security posture of GovCMS. Pretty big deal. Another example you've got here, which is what we mentioned earlier, which is um, health.gov.au, um, which is the uh, official source of critical health information. Okay, so here are many more sites delivering important information services to the citizen. However, we have to confess here, we're a little biased with these ones, as these little red uh, Salsa icons uh, denote sites that have been proudly built by our Salsa Digital, us, uh, with love. Um, aren't they beautiful? <laughs> okay. So now uh, moving on. Um, okay, so it's also worth highlighting the success of the program by calling out you know, leading government federal go agencies that have entrusted many of their websites onto the GovCMS platform. Again, there are lots of them um, with the Australian Department of Defence as one example to call out here. <clears throat> and again, many, many more, including the Australian Taxation Office. Okay. So it's time to get uh, technical, uh, God help us. And so again, to remind you, I'm not a Drupal developer and I've lost my uh, co-presenter partner in crime, Stephen today, uh, who would have presented this slide, but let's try. Uh, actually, before we do that, I'm just gonna have a glass of water. <laughs> okay. Excuse me, I just swallowed some ice. Okay, so what you are looking at is the architecture and tech stack for the consolidated uh, GovCMS platform. So for context, we have five sites <clears throat> uh, that are illustrated here, site A, site B, site C, X and Y. And then we have the platform components themselves, um, uh, which are, that sit underneath and they're shown obviously in the red and, and gray. And so um, the red, as you can see here from the legend, the red colored boxes represent, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, represent our common shared components. And the red uh, dotted lines uh, represent our individual uh, component instances uh, that are, are tailored per site. And so uh, what you'll also notice is that we've demarcated the SAS versus PAS components. <clears throat> so, uh, excuse me. So let's start with the common layers, um, the platform layer. So the platform layer represents that common hosting infrastructure and the common hosting infrastructure is made up of a, a multi-availability zone, AWS public cloud, right, for a resilient hosting. Uh, and then we've got Kubernetes uh, for container management. We've got CDN for uh, fast edge content delivery. We've got, um, <clears throat> excuse me, We've got web protection, which is made up of a variety of technologies and practices um, that are super secret uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so before we get on to the next layer, it is important to note that this common platform layer is security accredited, as we talked about earlier, uh, to a specific standard known as um, official sensitive. So then we have the tooling layer, and the tooling layer is another common layer supporting all the sites. And so here we have, you know, GitLab for both source code management and CI/CD pipelines for code consistency, security standards, and automated deployment processes. And then we have Docker containers uh, for Nginx and PHP. And we also have Lagoon for deployment management. And so now up to the application layer. And so the application layer is um, a common Drupal distribution, uh, each for Drupal 7, Drupal 8, and Drupal 9 Alpha, as I mentioned. And it's important to note that this, these distributions are a controlled list of contributed modules that undergo very, very strict vetting processes um, uh, with security, uh, among other factors, being the strongest. Uh, security naturally paramount, as you would expect. Um, they, these, in, the, in the distributions, they also contain standard content structures and uh, as a base. 
And so with all SaaS sites using uh, the, sorry, all SaaS sites use this same distribution um, with this standard set of functionality. And so other shared services, which is actually not modeled uh, here include um, virus scanning, mail delivery and caching services. Okay, so now let's talk about the separate and configurable uh, layers within the platform. So the first one is the content structures. So there are basic out of the box content structures, which are provided. Um, um, however, a website has the ability to adapt and create new content structures to meet its individual needs. And more likely than not, that often happens. Um, and the second uh, configurable and independent layer is the user interface. So there is a basic set of out of the box um, UI theme templates based off the Australian government design system, which is compliant with the uh, WCAG uh, accessibility standards. And again, uh, each agency has the ability uh, and flexibility to extend, adapt and create their own design templates. And again, uh, which they often do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna have some water again. I'm really sorry. Okay. And so finally, to put this in the uh, context of SAS versus PAS, for SAS, you have a fully managed secure platform um, it's a managed and controlled application, and it also provides the flexibility for agencies to adapt their content structures and their themes and the user experience. And for PaaS, so each site sits on an accredited, secure and resilient platform. However, each site has its own Drupal uh, install with complete control and flexibility, and they have the option to inherit the GovCMS distribution and customize that if they require. And with this level of flexibility and customization uh, also comes great responsibility um, around their own security, around um, their own performance, you know, all, all those good practices that you would expect in a good application. Okay, so that was heavy, right? Um, so the next three slides covers uh, program challenges, noteworthy celebrations and roadmap items. And there's a bunch of great insights throughout and I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's call um, one out for each. So one of the three program challenges captured here uh, for GovCMS is the number one highlighted here, uh, which is that GovCMS currently managed three distributions. Really hard, right? It's a high maintenance burden. Um, the, the positive side to look at this is that, you know, hopefully now with the end of life of Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, we will soon consolidate and fix that uh, for one distribution. So lots of noteworthy celebrations, um, but again, just to call one out, um, and it's a big one, is that GovCMS is breaking down silos between digital teams across government and uplifting technical maturity. That's a big, big deal. That can often be actually underestimated. But, and finally, roadmap, right? Lots of good stuff coming up uh, with three roadmaps listed here. Again, just to call one out in particular is the item number three listed, and that's platform scaling. And that's this continuous strong focus on optimizing and exploring innovative ways to scale to accommodate hundreds more sites and therefore a whole lot more traffic. Okay, so uh, now on to state jurisdictions. Um, so, so let's go to um, Western Australia. Okay. So here it is, so wa.gov.au. It's a single portal and a single user experience. So it's a single website where West Australian citizens go to get their information and citizens. So a couple of highlights here. Um, let, let's give the definition, right? So it's a whole of WA government CMS, uh, CMS platform, right, for West Australian citizens, or agency, sorry, to deliver information services to the citizens. Okay, so a couple of highlights is that it's four years old. There are currently 70 web presences with 303 uh, public servants um, on board onto the platform. It's running Drupal 8. Uh, unlike GovCMS, it's a consolidated platform, but it's also consolidated user experience, um, as well as it offers a centralized publishing distributed authorship model. Um, the other thing to highlight out here is it's, it's uh, moving towards a microservices based architecture. Okay, so WA, so Western Australian government offers two consumption models. The first consumption model is a fully managed platform, fully managed user experience um, uh, and fully uh, and, and web presence on the wa.gov.au domain. The second consumption model, um, you could argue is, is 
not really a consumption model, but it's basically for those that need their own URL, but everything else is, it, which is essentially just a redirect onto this platform. Um, okay, stats and facts. Again, just for the interest of time, um, uh, there's a lot captured. I'm only gonna call out um, a few of them. So two that I've highlighted here is in that the site has experienced a 400% structural increase in average load on the platform since COVID. Um, another interesting statistic here is that um, the platform have um, um, benefited from a $900,000, Australian dollars of course, uh, savings in licensing and maintenance fees after consolidating with Drupal. So, okay, two large and noteworthy agencies uh, adopting the, 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 the platform is what we've listed here is the Department of Finance and the Department of Justice. Um, okay, so onto the architecture and tech stack, and I'm not gonna repeat a lot of this because you're gonna start to see a lot of themes, and, um, but also without my technical um, aspiring partner, Steve, who's not here, I don't wanna misrepresent, but just to touch on a few things and some differences to the GovCMS model as I discussed earlier. And so all websites on the Western Australian platform are web presences, as you can see here, right? And um, with some exceptions, as I talked about earlier, um, some independent brands may have their own URL, but essentially they're a redirect to the web presence um, on there. And so as we talked about earlier, so, uh, so GovCMS is a fully managed secure hosting and Drupal application platform, right? With the flexibility for individual sites to customize. However, in this model, all layers, right? Including the content layer and the user experience layer are standardized and fully managed. And so that's a very big difference here. And so this is represented by all the red boxes and you see a lot of red, which is the common shared components. Um, as for the architecture stack, um, notable bits of differences are mostly around the platform and the tooling. You know, they use AWS EC2 CloudFront and Shield for cloud hosting, caching and security, um, as, as well as um, AWS code deploy and code commit for source code management and deployment. Um, and finally, they are now adopting a microservices based architecture. Um, for greater agility, scalability, and ease of maintenance. Okay, so one of three noteworthy challenges, or sorry, celebrations, I should say, sorry, uh, that have been captured for Western Australia um, is number two is highlighted here in that um, wa.gov.au was the single source of truth for COVID related information for WA citizens, which is um, a big milestone because it took away any confusion or discretion on where the citizen needed to go to get the most relevant uh, incredible um, information when it came to COVID. One of three noteworthy roadmap items captured for the Western Australian government is number three as highlighted here, and that's open APIs. And so open APIs basically uh, will enable the Western Australian government to unlock the government content, unlock the data and unlock their services to enable that true co-creation, co-innovation with, um, with the citizens and industry, which is what we talked about earlier. <clears throat> Okay, so on to the next state jurisdiction, um, which is the second last one, and that's the state of Victoria, um, the single digital presence. <clears throat> okay, so here it is, it's vic.gov.au. Again, it's one portal, it's one user experience, and it's appropriately named the single digital presence. <clears throat> and so it's a, obviously, it's a, a single website where Victorian citizens go to get their information. Um, I'm not going to repeat the definition. It starts to get a, a bit repetitive here, but some highlights to call out is that the program is two years old. It currently has 80 web presences and it's serving 250 public servants. It's on Drupal 8 and similar to Western Australia, it's a fully managed digital experience platform. Um, what's unique about this is that it's a uh, open source stack, but also that it's a headless decoupled architecture. And similar to Western Australia, it is a centralized publishing distributed authorship content model. So um, Victoria offers three consumption models. So you've got uh, vic.gov.au, which is that fully managed platform and that fully managed user experience uh, and web presence on that single domain, vic.gov.au. The second consumption model is basically sites with a separate domain, but with the Victorian brand um, on top of, again, fully managed platform, application, content, and experience. And then finally, you have this uh, third consumption model, um, which is uh, referred to as independent. And that's a fully managed platform, user experience and website, but with your own independent 
um, Drupal distribution and domain URL. And this particular one is only applicable for statutory and regulatory um, independent government agencies that need that legal separation. Okay, stats and facts uh, for the single digital presence. Again, lots captured and shown across here for you know program size, team, structure, etc. Um, but um, so two noteworthy to call out here is that the platform experienced an 8,200% spike in less than 30 minutes during uh, COVID peak loads. And this was at the time when the, uh, the Victorian Premier announced the, the roadmap, massive unprecedented amount of spike. So interesting um, statistic number two is that the platform has been measured to save Victorian agencies who are looking to build their websites up to 70% in build and operating costs. You know, that's uh, quite impressive. Okay, and so two more final stats, uh, which are totally worth uh, calling out, is that you know, there's been 13 new Drupal modules that have been created and open sourced on Drupal.org, um, as well as there's been 85 visual components as part of their um, design system that have been user tested and, and Wiki compliant that have also been open sourced on, on GitHub. Um, didn't I tell you it was worth it? Okay, so again, lots of great noteworthy sites on the Victorian digital platform. And again, not to call them out, but rather to give an impression and to state that there are many sites that are, are responsible for delivering important and critical information and services uh, to Victorian citizens uh, that are on the site, as of course with other government jurisdictions. You know, and, and Victoria Police is, um, is one here to name among many. Um, and another one here is the Victorian budget. Uh, website to name another. And again, lots of noteworthy, large and credible and reputable Victorian government departments and agencies have onboarded onto the platform, um, as you can see here. And now with the architecture in this tech stack, and, and again, and, and um, I'm missing my techie Steve, and I, I don't want to misrepresent the technical details, but key points to highlight in this architecture is that it's a hybrid approach. Um, between the GovCMS model and Western Australia. And so like Western Australia, it is a high, it's highly consolidated throughout all layers of the stack, um, as you can see here. Uh, so it's fully managed and highly compliant um, all the way through, including the user experience. Um, it also offers, however, the option for separate instances uh, for Drupal um, and for separate instances of Drupal, separate instances for the content model and separate instances for the UI. However, it is important to note that these are only available in special circumstances for those independent regulatory and statutory agencies that we talked about earlier. Um, one other uh, notable point, however, is that Victorian government, in this case for the independent sites, um, manage the entire stack separately. So they manage it on behalf of these independents, which takes away that burden and maintenance. Um, one final point to take out that's um, unique and different here is that it's a completely headless and decoupled architecture um, with the front end design system known as Ripple uh, being a decoupled UI based on Nuxt Vue.js. Um, okay, so uh, one of two noteworthy program challenges the Victorian government is number two as highlighted here, which is um, handling of an unprecedented amount of spikes during COVID. And it revealed some breaking points into the platform, which, um, you know, so discovery then triggered immediate remediation, resulting in greater resilience in handling subsequent spikes. I mean, that's the good news story, but it came with a little bit of pain. Okay, one of three noteworthy celebrations for the Victorian government is number two is highlighted below, which we did talk about earlier, is that headless architecture. And, and so Victoria's decision to invest in and build these, these decoupled headless architecture has really laid the foundation for among many things, you know, deduplication of uh, content data, unified citizen digital experiences, multi-channel and integration with and adoption of best of breed technologies. And finally, one of four noteworthy uh, roadmap items captured here is the first one here that's highlighted and that's um, them um, investing in uplifting the content editing and publishing experience for public servants. Okay, last one, and I know we've only got a little bit of time left, um, is the, and the last one is the youngest adopter of the three uh, state jurisdictions, New South Wales. So a little quick disclaimer here is that, you know, Drupal for New South Wales is still under evaluation by the custom, customer service in New South Wales as part of an MVP pilot. So we'll only focus on presenting program highlights based on the program pilot. So here it is, newsouthwales.gov.au. Again, 
a single portal, a single user experience. Look how beautiful it looks. <laughs> okay, so some key highlights to point out here is that it is an MVP pilot running on Drupal 8. It is a relatively young program um, and a lot of times been invested in getting many stakeholders uh, on board. Like the other states, it's, fully, it's a fully managed digital experience platform. And also like the other states, um, it is central uh, publishing uh, distributed authorship. Um, one major notable point of difference is here is that there is an official policy to mandate the platform uh, to create change and transformation, which will result in rapid consolidation of the sites and user experience over the next five years. Um, so yeah, similar to Victorian New South Wales, um, sorry, similar Victorian government, they offer the same consumption models, uh, but of course with the brand New South Wales um, um, the brand, sorry, in accordance with their own design system and BRAD guidelines. And as they're similar models, I don't need to go through them, each of them again. Okay, you know, so stats and facts for New South Wales. Again, important to emphasize that this is a relatively young program and, and they're in pilot. And so naturally the, um, the adoption and therefore stats are not going to be as mature and as developed. So that said, some interesting stats here to highlight is that there are 500 sites that have been targeted for consolidation as part of this policy mandate, right, um, over the next five years, which I just briefly uh, mentioned earlier. And that the New South Wales government, which is a pretty impressive stat, is that have had 100% uptime uh, since April 2020. That's not bad. Um, so here are you know, two noteworthy uh, credible departments that are on board onto the platform, as you can see here, births, deaths and marriages, as well as the Department of Customer Services. And so now just to, to highlight one of three strong focus program goals, um, which is the number three here, and very similar to others, and you see common theme, and that is to you know, uh, invest in digital capability to uplift the uh, New South Wales public servants, to enable them to upskill, to cross skill, and to thrive so that they can ultimately better serve the citizens. One of the three noteworthy challenges for New South Wales is number three is highlighted here, and it's a big one. And that is that change management is not to be underestimated, right? It takes time, effort, and patience to bring many, many, many stakeholders on the journey towards a consolidated whole of government platform. Um, and finally, one of the roadmap items to highlight here is personalization. Um, and that's for them to develop the, the capability to personalize the citizen experience based on a variety of par parameters of geolocation, uh, cookie collection, archetypes, et cetera. Okay, I, I know we've only got one or two minutes left and I've just a little bit of a wrap up. Um, one thing, and I'm, and I'm really sorry to have to rush this, but really I'm being very personally satisfied and encouraged to learn recently that there is this community sharing of practice, which is an informal collaboration between jurisdictions and nations. And so on a periodic basis, so these here, so GovCMS, single digital presence, New South Wales government and the Canadian government have been um, coming together um, to, you know, exchange roadmaps, um, ideas, pains, points, and so, and recently the Western Australian government has also joined this collaboration. And so here you have inner, jur inner jurisdiction collaboration, cross jurisdiction and international. That's really breaking down the silo. So that's um, pretty, very impressive. Okay, so it is getting towards the end, but I just wanted to leave with a fun fact. And that is South Sudan Digital's own website. So our website is built entirely on whole of Victorian government open source components. And we also use the same tech stack as the Victorian government. As a result, we've actually made several improvements, added new features, made some accessibility findings and shared them all back with the Victorian government. And this is really us, you know, really trying to practice what we preach. Um, all right, so that's a wrap up. And so there's a, a bunch of info that I'd like to share with you um, that may be of interest. And I'm, I'm conscious that we've got only seconds left. Um, but the first one is that there's a whole of government digital blueprint that we will be releasing um, in Q1 2021. And so we've released this blueprint Oh, sorry, we will be releasing the blueprint on what it takes to design, build, manage and scale whole of government digital platforms. The other one that uh, is of interest is the digital transformation in government publication series. It's a fortnightly publication that talks about cool things that are happening in government across the world. Um, and finally, there's a Drupal 9 information pack. 
Um, so, you know, it is DrupalCon after all. Um, we've recently published a whole lot of information, guides and services to help you upgrade, rebuild or migrate your site onto Drupal 9. And you can self-serve with these uh, free guides and blueprints. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, we have some open source tools as well around that. Or of course, you can get help from us. And so if any of these are interesting uh, or of interest for you, you know, you, please do uh, consider subscribing at the URL provided. Um, all right, finally, I need to pay my respects to uh, the people that are listed here. And I'm not going to individually list them, but I do do list them here to pay my respects and recognize them. Um, these are the people that I interact uh, within the jurisdictions uh, on a very regular basis. And uh, those that I've, um, you know, uh, you know, really helped contribute to this today. And so I'd like to personally recognize each of them for the interactions and learnings throughout my journey um, in preparing for this. So muchos gracias to uh, you people. Um, and finally, muchos gracias to all of you, the DrupalCon audience, and um, thank you for attending and uh, supporting my talk. Uh, time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. If you want to just check your um, questions in the start, we've got a few questions there. There are, I think, they were based on when you were speaking. So the first one was, um, has it been been built by a single agency? I think it's a reference to GovCMS. How long did it take to launch? I think that was also referencing GovCMS at the time when you were speaking. And the first one's also just a GovCMS CMS evaluation. Right. Okay. So um, let me start at the first one at the bottom of the list here. So how long did it take to launch the site? Uh, from the decision of Drupal to the first site. Okay, so each of the programs were different. Um, so if I can I talk to the one that's most front of mind for me right now is the Victorian government. So the Victorian government uh, probably uh, approximately took about six to eight months, but they went through an alpha beta program. So they did an alpha pilot with just one or two sample sites and then learned lots, matured the program, turned it into beta, and then uh, then eventually went into live, uh, which was a vic.gov.au. So that was about a six to eight month process. Um, so the second question we have here, um, which is also from uh, Stefan, is has this been built by a single agency? So um, each of them are all very different. Um, so if again, let's talk to GovCMS. So GovCMS is a great example, which is, um, so the distribution itself is made up of, you know, approximately 80, I think, um, contrib modules. So it's been, it's, it's a distribution made up of contrib modules from the community. So the distribution itself, right, which is the power of open source, the platform um, has been um, yeah, developed by a, um, by a single agency, yes. Um, so, yeah, sorry, and I should also elaborate, it's, it's hosted and managed by actually um, two agencies which are in partnership. The third question we have here from um, Maika, 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 I hope I pronounced that, sorry, clarifying my question, uh, CMS evaluation results. So let me see, it's saying, how many Australian service providers get a piece of the cake? Was it a push for the local economy? So that's a very good question. So let's talk about um, GovCMS. So GovCMS, has what uh, they've established what's called a Drupal services panel. So the Drupal services panel is made up of, actually I'm, I'm going to guess here, so please don't quote me, but it's a, approximately 20 uh, give or take agencies, uh, Drupal services, and they had to go through a, obviously a, uh, a qualification process to get onto the panel um, to, and so they all are agencies that can help all these other government agencies uh, to help build their websites and onboard them onto the platform. Um, I hope I've answered that. And I think that was all the questions. And so we're probably way out of time here now. And uh, Akil, am I right to assume we should just uh, wrap up now? We can sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Great. Okay. Thank you all. I, uh, yeah, appreciate your time. Thank you. Ciao.